second before we start. Um, so we are recording this webinar, um, which means, of course, you can re-watch it over and over again afterwards, or probably more likely share it with the colleagues who weren't able to, uh, to join the, the webinar today. Lovely to see so many of you on the chat this morning already. Please do feel free to introduce yourself. It's a great way to network with other people. Of course, if we were all together in person, we could be sharing a coffee right now. But um, yeah, use the chat to do, to do your introdu introductions and um, uh, you know network with people afterwards. And if you've got a question for any of us, um, we've also got the Q&A open. Please do pop it in there. We'll be um, checking it as we go through. We've had some questions already in advance, I know, but um, uh, anything that kind of prompts you as we go through, yeah, please do free, feel free to pop it in the Q&A as well. So here's some proper introductions. Uh, first of all, I want to say a big thank you again to Alex, um, who we're delighted to, to be joined by today. Um, Alex is representing uh, London South Bank University, where he's Director of Innov Innovation and Transformation there, which is a pretty impressive job title, uh, Alex, and <laughs> we'll be looking forward to hearing more, more from you as we go through. Um, Alex is an, an experienced IT director. He's got a proven track record of success in, uh, in all sorts of uh, sectors, including visitor attraction, hospitality, and now where he finds himself in the education sector in the UK. And we've also got our very own Equantis Director of Business and Digital Consulting for Education, Melody Ascari. Uh, although she doesn't look old enough, she's got 20 years experience in higher ed and uh, calls herself a, a self-styled ed tech evangelist, which is uh, one of the most impressive uh, intros uh, we have. Uh, again, we'll hear a bit more from, from Melody about why, why she uh, has that kind of self-styled um, name. But because Melody has uh, experience both inside uh, higher ed and as a consultant, she's really uniquely placed to, to give us her view um, from both the inside and the outside. And uh, my name is Janine Chasmer. I'm one of the managing consultants at Qantas. Um, my uh, role primarily is to guide and support organisations who are looking to become more operationally efficient or improve their, their customer or their student experience. Okay, thank you very much, Janine. Um, so, why are we here? Um, so, as Janine, before we get going, so as Janine mentioned, um, please do pop any questions that you have um, for either of us or for Alex in the chat. Um, and we also have a little poll at the end uh, where we thought it'd be fun for you guys to have a go at assessing your own institution's data maturity. So, uh, we'll get to that a little bit later on. Uh, but, firstly, why are we here? So this is um, this webinar is part of a ooh, sorry it just fall, pulled forward prematurely. This part this webinar is part of a wider series of webinars that Qantas is, is delivering and uh, facilitating on the subject of digital transition and digital transformation in the HE sector. Um, and you know we're really well aware that HE itself is in a state of transition and change. Institutions have reacted really swiftly and effectively to the effects of COVID with online and hybrid curriculums and virtual student services. Um, there's been a lot of high level planning and forecasting and measures put in place to mitigate the impact of um, Brexit. And we all know that Data Futures has been sort of waiting in the eaves for its turn on centre stage. So, you know, HE is doing a lot and a lot of institutions, um, even pre-COVID, were starting to respond to some of those challenges that we were encountering. encountering. But actually, we found that and I'm sure that you guys have found that, that things have really sped up on the other side, you know, as we emerge out of the other side. Um, and really people, systems, technologies, processes have been really um, challenged or put to the test or stress measured by the last two years. Uh, and institutions have a much clearer idea of what it is they think they're going to need in order to manage this sort of new environment of education in the UK. And for what it's worth, of course, we are, um, dealing with digital native students, you know, the, the, the guys coming through are used to having apps and online technologies. They do everything online in their personal lives and they expect the same online on demand student services, curriculums, delivery support from their institutions. And this is something that we are well aware uh, at Aquantis, and I'm sure Alex is working to the same at LSBU, having to navigate some of those challenges and make sure that we're able to rise up and meet them. So with all of that in mind, uh, what has this got to do with data? 
So there is a recognition that tools and technologies need updating and replacing, right? We're really clear that we are dealing with, in some cases, really antiquated systems that have been in place for a long time. They don't talk to each other. They don't house the data that we need. They've not been cleansed. Practices and governance and retention, you know, all, all the things in and around data are really in the spotlight. Uh, and as a result, we want to look at then processes and working practices and we need to review those and make sure they're all optimised as well. And all of this has to happen through the lens of the student experience. This is what institutes are here for. You know, this is what we want to do. We want to drive a, a, an effective student experience. We want to engage with those students and ensure that they are fit for the marketplace, essentially, to go out and, and work and, uh, you know, take on great graduate jobs um, afterwards. So but interestingly, whilst we get a lot of commentary and requests around wanting to use data strategically to meet those challenges, what we actually find, um, and I'll see Janine nodding uh, furiously here, is a lot of our clients want to go straight into te technology. They think technology, buying a new system, getting a new system implemented is the key to, to resolving all of those challenges. But actually what we found, and I think something that Alex and I will talk to a little later on, is that perhaps... Perhaps there is a moment of reflection before you get going, before we get going on these really big pieces of transition around having a clear data strategy that feeds into your digital strategy before you go on and embark and do those, those other activities, those technology activities. Thinking strategically about data from the outset of any programme um, really does set up a, a foundation for success in, in, in our experience. So given all this and given that we love all things data here at Equantis, we thought it'd be a really good opportunity today to get our colleagues from the HE sector together um, to walk you through what it means, what data maturity actually, uh, sorry, a data strategy actually means, and then uh, talk about some of the dimensions that make up a good data strategy and uh, tend to some of the things that you need to consider if you want to start thinking about what, what a data strategy might look like in your own institution. And then more importantly, more interestingly, we get to talk to Alex from South Bank University, who uh, heads up the innovation and transformation and, and have had experience of, you know, starting to think about data in the context of these wider transformations and change programmes. Um, you know, and I, and I think really we want to talk to you and interact with you guys to together so that we can learn together, overcome these roadblocks, really, you know, to have some dialogue and some collaboration around this. So I think that is the key to success in this with this particular challenge. So um, what is a data strategy and what does it actually mean for the HE sector? So. I had, uh, you know, we've had lots of experience in, in data and data strategy here at Aquantis, and we have various different definitions that we use to help start framing what data strategy looks like. Um, and this Gartner one, actually, um, whilst it doesn't reference higher education specifically, it's actually a really helpful definition. So it states that a data strategy is a highly dynamic process employed to support the acquisition, organisation, analysis and delivery of data in support of business objectives. Now, this is just a definition, but actually, um, even without the dimensions that we will get to shortly, this really starts to help us frame how we might approach data in higher education. It really starts to help us think about how we think about data in HE. So when we think about bonding to external factors, to internal factors, we have data futures, we have changes to admissions processes just from pre to pro, you know, post uh, results. We have all of these things that impact on us. We're, we're used um, politically, like, that, you know, we have a lot of external influence that, that comes in and adjusts our journeys whilst we are trying to maintain our you know, academic integrity and our ability to deliver a great service and, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, education to our students. So it, it needs to be done. A data needs to be dynamic in order to accommodate all of those challenges that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. 
And then we employ it. So we want to use the data that we have to support the acquisition and organization. So where do we get our data from? How do we collect it? Are we collecting the right things? Where are we housing it? What does the organization of it look like? You know, does it support what we need it to support in the institution? When we think about analysis, analysis and support of business objectives, is the analysis you're doing driving your university's strategic goals, your strategic ambitions, your, your priorities? Are you using data intelligently to help drive those uh, conversations? Do your teams use predictable prescriptive analytics to help engage with your students and drive their student outcomes? You know, there is so much around the analysis of data. And then the delivery, sometimes an afterthought, but are you delivering your data to the right people in the right format? Are people able to consume the data properly in order to be able to support those business objectives? So, you know, in, in the first instance, you think, oh, this is just another Gartner definition of anything, because they have a definition for all sorts of, you know, all sorts of digital things. But actually, I find this a really nice way to start thinking about um, a data, and it's something that you can take away and start thinking about in your own departments and your own institutions. So I've talked, you know, broadly about what data is. I'm going to hand over to Janine, um, who's going to talk you through some of the data challenges that we have encountered at Equantis. Um, in the HE sector, and then we'll get going with a brief overview of the primary data dimensions. Thanks, Melody. Yeah, I think we like to, to, to start with what's the, the, the business challenge that our clients are looking to um, address, or, or is there a you know, particular compelling event that is requiring you to, to start to look at data or to think about transition or, or data transformation? Back in 2018, or in the run-up to uh, May 2018, uh, a lot of clients that we were working with were, you know, really looking to that compelling event of the the, uh, the advent of GDPR. So actually, data became a really hot topic for lots of our clients around that time. Uh, it's more things like um, uh, information security or cyber security as well as a kind of natural stepping stone away. So I think compliance is is definitely an, an area um, of challenge, continues to be an area of challenge actually, um, and was a reason why people were, or lots of institutes were focusing um, perhaps on, on, on data. And then of course, with data features coming in, as, as Melody's um, mentioned, or, you know, HESA returns other compliance, you know, that's a continuing challenge. So, you know, a, again, making sure that you've got the data in the right way, in the right, at the right times to be able to do those returns is, is of course, you know, for someone in your organisation, giving them headaches, uh, it tends to be a small team, so, you know, uh, or a large team, if you're lucky, uh, you know, uh, uh, beavering away to, to, to try and do that work. But of course, it affects everybody because how you collect data, how you store data and how you make that available to those teams to do those uh, necessary returns is, is really important. So, so you have to be able to surface that data, as Melody said, when you need it. And then I think um, certainly before COVID, and it's starting to pick up again a bit now, I think data challenges, and then the reason we had uh, clients stepping forward and speaking to us um, was to, to really put the, the, the lens on to improving um, student engagement. So I think we've seen um, you know, lots of challenges around duplicate records, and of course, that's that's um, uh, you know affected a, a lot of the time because you've got maybe da duplicate data sets or disconnected systems with with pockets of data in that become uh, replicated and, and and therefore not able to have a sort of single student view. And actually, for for lots of institutes, that insight and intelligence is just has just not been possible. You've got it, but you're just not able to surface it or report on it or do, do what you need to do in the right way and at the right time. And, you know, with the with, with COVID, of course, um, still focusing on student engagement, you know, for, for many institutes, it's just been about, well, let's get the learning done. You know, let's 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 make sure that students can uh, access the, 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 the learning and the tools that they need to, to learn and, and actually student engagement has been you know really trying over the last uh, 18 months to, to two years so you know being able to um, 
to, to use data for student engagement has been has been difficult and it has been even more difficult with, with COVID and, and not being able to to be as close to our students as we'd like to. And then I think there's also continued challenges around um, the student experience. And, and again, data is impacting that because you know students are customers, as, as we say a lot, to interact with you in the same way that they'd interact with another type of business. And so if they've told one department over here something about them, they they, you know, when they ring your institute, they just they, or interact with you as, as their university, they expect you to know about them. And if they've told somebody at uni uh, something about them, they expect other parts of the university to know that moment or at the same uh, campus or, you know, in, in, uh, or that you don't have access to, to the same systems. Something that I know Alex will be passionate about when, when we when we chat later is, um, you know, keeping the competitive edge. And of course, uh, you know that's been again you know heavily impacted by by covid but um you know thinking about data framing data from you know from a strategic point of view you know thinking about objectives and, and kpis you know data is, is in, incredibly you know important and, and front and foremost when when business planning etc and again if you don't have the data that you need to be able to help inform those um, decision cycles and they are long decision cycles often in in higher education um, then you know that can really um, you know really hamper uh, your ability to to achieve those those um, those visions and, and strategies. I mean, I mentioned no single version of the truth already, but disjointed data and the staff frustration about that and the inefficiency in your processes that that uh, in in turn um, affects becomes this kind of overwhelming. Um, you know cycle that is is difficult for institutes to get around and because you're so busy doing the business as usual stuff and and keeping the, the show on the road and, and doing all the good stuff that you need to do there isn't always the time to, to kind of move to one side and say right let's uh let's pause and you know work on our data strategy because you know we, we would like to achieve some things there just isn't the time to do that and so you know, because of the way that, that you work in cycles and, um, you know, you've got these kind of pockets of time where things are very, very busy, um, you don't have that, that time as a luxury. Um, and so, you know, it, it's one of those things, I think data strategy is one of those things that just gets pushed to the side because there isn't the time to do it. Some of you may be on a transformation journey and like Alex, maybe, you know, putting in new systems or, or, or um, trying to connect systems together or thinking about doing things in different ways. And really, um, as Melody said earlier, I think that the biggest um, issue we see is institutes, you know, take an approach, let's plug a new system in because that will fix all of our problems and not thinking about the data first and foremost. Um, yes, of course, we want to consider whether tools and technologies are fit for purpose. Um, but if you, if you put a new system in without thinking about the, the, the data journeys first, um, you're going to get the same outcomes whichever system you're using. So we often ask organisations, well, you know, when you're, in, you do, you're doing your implementation, have you got data in mind when you're doing that implementation? Because um, without it, um, you know, it's going to cause trouble upstream, even if you're not aware of it now. And I think from a staff point of view, um, when you're doing these big transformation projects or smaller transformation projects, there's this real kind of cultural sense at the beginning, like, brilliant, we're getting a new system that's going to fix everything, let's all get behind it, everything will be great. And then when you get to, you know, testing or implementation, the morale, the culture, the, the excitement drops because um, there's this almost this kind of penny drop moment where staff go, hang on a minute, this is not quite, or well, this is not solving all the problems I have before. Um, you know, we've still got, you know, because we're still doing things in the same way, we've still got the same data challenges that we had previously. And then, of course, if you then um, start to layer over other tools and technology, so you might be replacing one system and then you've got to start thinking about, well, how do we get that interoperability around our other systems? You know, if that data journey hasn't been thought of right from the very beginning, then, of course, that's, you know, getting that, that, that one new system is going to, you know, really seriously affect the other uh, the performance of other systems as well, because the data is is you know should be like a river flowing through, and if and if it's if there are blockers with one system, it's just not going to do that. 
So uh, hopefully uh, you will be looking at this uh, word cloud thinking, yep, uh, I can either see myself in that word cloud or uh, these are all, all things that we have um, either experienced at some time or, or, um, or, or, you know, have felt that pain. So what we want to do now is just move on to um, talk about some, some dimensions of uh, data strategy that, that we think um, help you to kind of focus on particular areas to, to, to start thinking about how to build up that, that data strategy out. So if we start with, with governance and, and, and leadership, governance is about how your organisation looks after its data, right, and ensures that proper uh, use and, and compliance. And the leadership is the, the degree to which the, the data is a strategic um, priority for your organisation. So it's the importance of, of um, the data informing your universities or institute strategic objectives and a clear data governance framework that's in use and, and well embedded throughout your organization. Um, often clients tell us, yeah, we've got a data strategy and we ask them, oh great, can we see it? And they kind of dust it off and get it out of the drawer somewhere and nobody's actually uh, reflected on it or looked at it for some time. Or, or senior staff have created it and they haven't shared it with, with other staff uh, who, you know, who are the ones that are actually you know, doing the job and, and delivering. Um, so yeah, who gets the data, how do they use it, is there a consistency of terminology, um, are people talking the same language, uh, I mean, you, HE, like the other sectors we work in, has its own language completely, but even between departments, between, sometimes between IT and the rest of the business, we just see, you know, different, uh, different use of language and, and that can, can sometimes be a challenge. Yeah, I, I'm really, um, I'm really keen to get Alex's thoughts on on these dimensions as we work through. Alex, I'm sure that you've got a lot to say about. I, well, I was, I was I sat there, but I didn't want to not uh, Janine's flow, but I'm absolutely can relate to to everything covered so far. And I, I, just a quick um, hello to everybody. So it's, it's fantastic to see quite a few familiar names on the uh, participant list this morning. So um, thanks so much for joining the session. It's a pleasure to be. Uh, presenting uh, alongside Qantas this morning on a topic that's from sure relevant to to absolutely everybody you know certainly in the higher education space but probably in any um, kind of sector at the moment um, everybody's striving to deliver digital um, overwhelmed with numerous technologies um, and, and, and as a kind of uh, worked in IT for, for many many years um, one thing we've, we've, we've always been good at is bringing lots of new stuff in but not so very good at turning off the old um, and we can become swamped and overwhelmed with numerous kind of software and applications, um, old bespoke um, in-house built um, programs uh, that effectively become embedded uh, within, certainly in the university. One thing I underestimated when I joined the university world was the sheer complexity and magnitude of the technology stack. Um, and I think it's probably high important just to say that, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of data. It, it is almost overwhelmed with data as much as there are technologies, but it's, it's sporadic. It's, it's kind of not all joined up. Um, and where we are now, probably over the last couple of years, is um, everybody's striving to deliver that kind of, um, I almost feel like, a, but my analogy is like an iceberg. So you can see, the, when you see the top of the iceberg, you don't care what's underneath the water, the lower levels, and, it, and it's really concentrating some of those more, um, plumbing elements that, that make up your technology um, stack, getting hold of the data, owning that data, um, and then being able to utilize it to deliver the kind of UX layer at the top thing, uh, top as well. Um, just on your slide here, the governance and leadership, one thing that we've um, has helped actually um, since, since the engagement with yourselves um, was actually data um, ownership, management and, and usage um, is a shared um, responsibility across the whole yeah. Um, institution yeah. and, and what we found typically was it's just with data or it's a technology thing it's because it's an IT IT concern and of course you've got data protection officers and um, with GDPR and, and, and all the other security considerations that have, have surfaced um, over the last kind of five to ten years but um, it is still deemed um, you talk something about data and thinking oh what's that you know it's just a technology term you know um, what we've had here um, and, and going through your slides right now is actually awareness of and stress the importance of, um, of data, um, its retention, its usage, and how long, you know, um, who has access to what. Um, and that will come out again when I, when I talk a little bit um, further down the line. Um, but yeah, you know, absolutely governance and leadership um, at the forefront 
Um, sorry, Janine, I, 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 I won't stop talking, so I'll hand back to you. To you. But I'll, 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 some of my stuff, I'll come out my my, my, my views uh, a little bit later on. Uh, actually, we're, we're going to move on to data culture, actually, and, I, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this as well, Alex, because I know, um, obviously, we've done some work together in, a, in and around data strategy at LSBU, and one of the things that we, we looked at was this idea of data culture, you know, an understanding of who is responsible for the data in, in pragmatic and practical terms, who owns the data assets, where do they live, where do you go to get access and things like that. But almost more importantly, it's this, how are you, how are your departments, your faculties, your schools sharing their data? How are they making sure that, that they are collecting data that is complementary and also drives, you know, those strategic objectives and the strategic goals of the institutions? And then, and then there are those questions, aren't there, around how is it safeguarded? How is it, kept, uh, you know, kept secure? And, and those issues in and around GDPR um, and data protection. I mean, you know, what are your thoughts on, on data culture more generally in the sector and, and at Yeah, I think, I'll be honest with you, I think it's a double-edged sword. So there is, and we, you know, as an example of us, we have a data warehouse, we have a, um, it's quite a visualisation tool that's open and accessible to, to anyone who wants access to effectively can just, you know, almost trying to drive a self-service um, element to be able to get, get a valuable insight into your specific area, um, you know, all student matters student um, across the board. Um, that's one side and that, that's great, but um, I think what we've found is what, actually, what data actually resides within there and actually the bits of information that are more probably interesting tend to be quite the reverse. We do have um, sort of data custodians um, and they can potentially be a little bit kind of protective around that. Yeah. Um, and actually yeah. you'll find it's when you start asking and particularly as we're going through transformation programs on my side being one half of a technology function not you know all about the modernization trying to make um you know make everything um deliver uh with it, with the student needs at the forefront of, of everything we're delivering but um it's almost when you ask for it so like, well, well why do you want it who you know what are you doing with it you know, it, you know you've got to get 10 20 sign-offs to get to get relatively straightforward simple piece of information Absolutely. um particularly and it, and, it, and it's it, it's so, so so don't get me wrong this I'll bring a question of data and information, um, but there, there is a level of um, insight and there is a, an accessible amount of data. Yeah. Our question and what we found is actually the relevance of the data in terms of helping you get some of those strategic goals and actually some of the good stuff, the kind of core infinite data that really is um, going to benefit right across all you know, schools and, and professional service groups. You'll find it is some people... It is it almost always overprotected, so that and, and, and you know, in some areas it should be, but others it's really defining well data classification. Okay, absolutely, if it's personal and it's specific and things that are um, you know personalised to whether it's a member of staff or a student, absolutely, you know that needs to be that there's a sense of reassurance that you're you know we're, we're guarding and protecting yeah. that and it's only there for for whatever reason. But there's also a whole raft of information in terms of like student engagement and, and how people are actually interacting with. Um, the campus you know from physically from, from actually being on premise but also all of the multitude of different um hybrid working tools that we have as well um and that's kind of really the bit that we really were almost steering the roadmap in terms of where we're going next and yeah and i, I think it'd be wrong it's it's it, and it really it's a data strategy but it's also i, I think that the other side to it is, is the data awareness and actually wouldn't it be great if we actually collaborated and shared this wealth of information to help um deliver some of the, the top level goals that we want yeah um so that's my view on it. It's um, it, it's better than it was, but I still think we've got some way to go. Yeah, I, I don't think that's an unusual circumstance. Actually, I think I think most HE institutions, and I, and I don't know whether the the, the guys who are, who are watching the webinar will will be nodding or, or sort of shaking their head in disagreement. But I suspect that is you know that feels like it's the case across most HE institutions. There is a real there's starting to be a real understanding about what what data could could present the opportunities data could present, but there is. There is now the sort of the practicalities of our well, actually how do we make that happen and how do we embed that in the university and how do we engage our staff to understand that data is really helpful and really useful not only on that sort of business as usual but also delivering and driving that student engagement and pushing things forward and even if there's a will sometimes there isn't a way at, at this particular moment to be able to do that 
you know, it's the big kind of understanding the value of the data and, and the new catchy slogan is data is the new oil and actually the, the, the data, the value of every of any business, so it's a university or in the private sector or local government, what have you, the, the value of the data is um, fast outweighs kind of physical assets um, and, and it's what exactly. you do with that data yeah. to help you deliver and, and going back to your you know, competitive sides, you know, this, so we could take that word with a pinch of salt, but I think everybody is trying to deliver and striving to deliver yeah, the same absolutely. outcomes people at different stages of that um but really you know the enabler and, and what's going to get you ahead of the game is, is going to be um is really master you know but say getting getting a roadmap a strategy together that aligns your um deliveries your portfolio of an investment cycle um, and awareness and, and operating procedures wrapped around it that will really give you that potential competitive edge when i say that and it means ahead of the game let's say Absolutely. Yeah, I think competitive edge, not, not, not. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think that bears out on our on our next slide around use and analysis, actually, um, Alex, because you know most in institutions we're working with are you know are able to to use some data to tell them what's happened or you know to do some sort of basic analysis. They might have dashboards, um, but you know it was interesting working with LSBU to see you know how data can be used for more advanced analysis to assess KPIs or provide basic alerts and, and you know, mastery is, as we've discussed it with you is, you know, enabling an institute to deliver a scenario optimization, predictive modeling, decision support. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to hear your view. Yeah, just um, I think well, it goes back to the term it's we refer to as um, the traditional time of business intelligence, isn't it? So you have a BI platform or you have a BI, you know, reporting to a, a data warehouse and it's going, well, actually, and one thing we've said is, you know, we, we're doing a sense of using it for reporting, kind of mandatory and compulsory reporting, but where's yeah. the intelligence lie? I think if you've got a level of intelligence there, um, yeah. to a degree, um, but I wouldn't say to the level of where you're getting into the whole machine learning and the automation, the predictive side of things, which is where all the clever stuff is. Yeah. And I don't think, I think, we've, I think we've got the, we've certainly got the components to do that. We've got the data there. And actually it's just, it, I think we've got the drive to do it. Mm. I think it just needs, it just needs to be picked up as a topic and, and, and it actually, let's write down from the technical teams to, to, the, you know, to the various um, operators and the and users of, of the, of the, work streams that feed into this platform mm. um is only when you start saying the kind of art of the possible and actually showing you know here's where we are right now and it, and it kind of is, as much as we did a uh, strategy we also did a maturity assessment and you're here you could be here and actually if you just did this this and this you could probably get there quite quickly and it's like really well wow, that's cool yeah. didn't know we could do that but it's uh, i think it's just it's gonna be, it's always been there as, a, as an entity um it's picking it up as a company as, as it, you know, that that kind of um that umbrella piece that sits everything else sits beneath it data at the top and actually be focused on the data in the first instance then everything else will become like, far more simpler and then when you look at kind of the business intelligence side you didn't you're absolutely you know within the business mandatory reporting compulsory stuff the intelligence the automation the predictive side which is scarily accurate um is yeah. is really where the excitement comes you start talking about it. it's an interesting that's why people are here today it's a topic of um, it's it's mm. new it's exciting there's some people now so someone asked me so well, who, who's really mastered has anyone actually done really well at this i'm the only person i think of amazon you know they amazon's a prime example of who absolutely nailed the whole kind of data piece yeah um there's an awakening in the higher education space to say actually we've got all this valuable they look at you know certainly twenty thousand students you know international basis all different demographics different age groups and um, we also, uh, with LSPU, we've got a college, we've got an FE institution of schools, and wouldn't it be cool if we could start looking at, you know, the life cycle or student passport, we refer to as, you know, the entire life cycle of the student journey. Yeah. That's where the excitement comes, and it's, don't get me wrong, there's some visionary stuff in there, but equally, there's also some some kind of really quick value stuff that uh, has some light bulb moments spark up. Yeah, there's some, there's there, there is there is a sort of mix, isn't there? It's like getting the foundations right and getting those quick wins in place, and, and there are some because inevitably everybody is on that, that as you said that data maturity journey, and right people, uh, institutions are mostly in that sort of learning phase, and we'll get to this a little bit later, and, and there's a little bit more clarity around what that actually looks like. Um, but if you can get that bit right, then you really get to move into that super exciting stuff, and as you say, that understanding a student life cycle and really. Um, if you can get yourselves into a position as an institution where you understand your student almost before they've arrived, you know, you, your applicants, if they're, no, if they're not 
ready to come to you that you are able to provide decision support on where they should go and then you sort of maneuver them through the FE college and then back into the institution because what you're doing is a giving that student what they need b uh, you know selfishly from an institutional perspective you're setting yourself up to win because what you have then are students who are in the right place who have got the right learnings the right support mechanisms all in place to succeed at your institution which means your learning outcomes look great your league tables go up so you know it really is about data is such a great tool for doing that and i think you're absolutely right your assessment that there has been a data awakening in the he sector people are starting to realize actually how how meaningful and how useful it can be to to um to use data to help them deliver their business objectives so if we move on to um if we move on to data collection which is the next one of the um the next one of the um dimensions that we look at when we're when we're looking at what data what a data strategy might look like and also one of the dimensions around data maturity this is really about how you collect your data. You know, is it accurate? Do you know where it is? Do you understand what your data flows are? Do you understand where there is duplication of data? Do you have departments collecting the same data in their own CRMs? And, and uh, you know, I, I don't think I'm out of turn when I say we've, we've definitely encountered institutions that have five or six different CRMs, depending on what department they're in. They have, you know, completely independent admissions processes, uh, enrollment, you know, all, all sorts of things going on. Um, I mean, uh, Alex, what's your view on, on data collection at LSBU? How, how are you tackling this challenge? Where do you think you guys are? Yeah, <laughs> it made me smile because I'm, and it's, it, yeah, it, 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 it's, so well, yeah, we had, um, when I joined, we actually had seven CRMs um, in the first instance, and um, we could be so not, not kind of, everybody, uh, all, all the different departments were utilising different um, customer relationship management tools, service desk tools, um, and it, I, apparently it, was un, it wasn't uncommon, as you say, because we had, I remember having a um, Microsoft in and he said to me, the worst thing come across was the university at 18. So actually I actually didn't feel too bad when we had seven minutes. <laughs> um, but, um, but you can imagine when you're mapping out the, the student interaction, right from, you know, if you look at it, traditional kind of serum as account management piece and, and if we're using, um, We've, we've, we've got a sent, we, we're moving towards a centralized CRM, which is, uh, we've been on a journey for the last, um, two point well, about two years, but not so much of the technology change, but also an operational change as well. Um, but yeah, to, to your point is, um, it's no wonder it's you know, it's disjointed from both you know, from a student perspective and from an operator perspective when um, you're trying to get to the information or trying to get to an answer, whether that be physically on campus or, or even online. Um, and then there's no single kind of single view of the customer, in this case, the student. I mean, everybody is looking at different kind of tool sets, different reporting suites and different data sets. Um, then it's inevitable that actually it's going to be a poor experience. Yeah, um, so that, um, as I said, is, is, is really, from a CRM perspective, um, not uncommon. And I think if you looked at a lot of university strategies right now, they're aware of that. Um, yeah. and actually moving towards to get a centralised CRM um, to, to try and help um, to, to get that joined up um, view. But uh, I don't want to, I won't stress it too much because I, I know I can give you a, another kind of bit more example in a little bit of that. That'd be amazing. And actually that leads really nicely into this sort of tools and technologies. Janine, I know this is a, this is a Yeah, particular... <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it does lead on really nicely because, you know, this is, you know, we, we, we've just talked about, you know, what are you collecting and now, you know, how, how are you collecting it? So, you know, what, what tools and technologies do you have to be able to collect, manage, use data across your organisation and, um, you know, whether or not it's it's paper forms or questionnaires, surveys, polls, online tools, um, your SRS or a CIS, uh, your C a CRM, all seven of them, Alex, uh, social media apps, you know, uh, I, I, was, I was actually thinking only seven. I've seen I've seen a lot worse. Don't worry. Uh, worse, I mean, uh, a lot, a lot more challenging. Um, but yeah, um, and yet, you know, and then it's the other stuff. And, you know, what have you got in filing cabinets or on local devices, shared areas, personal areas, cloud based systems, devices, cameras, USBs, dashboard. Um, yeah, I mean, and I think this is really a really good slide, for, especially for, for people on the, the chat who are thinking, OK, yeah, well, we are in the middle of transformation. We're doing a, you know, we're doing a thing. We've got we've got a system coming in. OK, great. I'm, I'm glad that, that, that that's the case. This is the slide to think about how to put data front, you know, front and, 
and 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 center in in that project because um you know we it, it's all very well um you know uh, thinking about data migration as part of that project but when when we're working with, with clients who often say okay what why have you got that data oh yeah you know uh, well, we do we need this field oh we haven't we haven't used that data for 10 years but because it's in our system because it's on our form we just we're just collecting it and we've just got all this stuff about people's shoe size we don't we don't ask that anymore so we don't need it anymore but we're still collecting it because it's on the form uh, what we'd really like to know is uh, if we've got any glasses wearers um but we've we can't we haven't got there's no field for that on the form so we can't collect that information and we I don't know what university you go to, yeah. Janine, whether I'm <laughs> <laughs> We could really help. So, yeah, I think, you know, this is these, these two slides definitely go hand yeah, in hand. Um, if we move on to, and uh, uh, I'm going to skip over the tools and, and the technologies, because I know, uh, uh, Alex, uh, we've got quite a bit to talk about in, in a short while around that area with LSB. So I'll skip over to skills and competencies. Um, this is the final, one of the final dimensions that we look at, but arguably you know, equally as important as, as the other ones. And this is really about... You might have all of the data, you've, you've done your data modeling, you've done your data strategy, you have fabulous um, goals that you can use data to help drive, but actually do you have the skills and competencies and capabilities within your institution to deliver that level of analysis? Do you have people who are capable of delivering predictive model, uh, modeling, who, who can manage complex data sets, who are, which are large, you know? manage big dashboards all those sorts of things do you have an appropriate training and uh, on data protection and security in place that is ongoing that's maintained that people are clearly aware and this feeds really into the data culture right as well these things come hand in hand so um and again i'm gonna i'm gonna skip over this a little bit because i know we're gonna we're gonna get to some of these some of these challenges uh, at lsbu so i'm gonna move on to um a slightly more informal discussion with Alex about, about uh, transformation and innovation at LSBU and data strategy um, within that context. Um, yeah, for sure, because I think, I think one of the things we haven't probably heard enough from Alex, uh, uh, Melody, is, is just actually what, what's going on at, at LSBU at absolutely. the moment, because there's a whole transformation landscape, Alex, like we've mentioned CIS and CRM and has read it already but could you could you just explain a bit more about how that program of work and data strategy you know are, are supporting each other yeah sure uh, so so let me give you a kind of run through so um, back in 2019 we actually embarked on a um, student transformation program uh, a, a lot like other institutions and this was really to reinvent the student experience um, while studying at LSPU, um, and I guess also um, focusing on the operations, the experience they were having, um, and it was driven a lot from a lot of us uh, feedback from the National Student Survey results, feedback from our uh, academic colleagues, um, all the different manners that you know that actually um, we listen to and, and hear from from uh, both staff and students across LSPU. <laughs> Um, one thing that was uh, was really clear is that the student experience was actually broken uh, and needs to be reinvented, um, both from a people, process and technology perspective. Um, and we focused on the student journey right from inquiry management to end-to-end -end student life cycle and right up to alumni. Mm. Uh, it was spread into several themes, um, uh, but ultimately led to two kind of significant technology changes um, that I've referred to already. One was to get a centralised CRM. Uh, it's going to point you at seven, which was not ideal in terms of the experience you were delivering uh, to the student because it was clearly uh, not a single pane glass view of the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other one was to focus on the heart of our data, uh, which was actually the golden record, which resided in our student information system. And some people say student information system or student record system. Uh, our student record system, 20 years old, um, it was, don't get me wrong, he absolutely got our money's worth out of that as a, as a uh, system, but it was clearly not capable of delivering the kind of digital uh, joined up experience that we needed it to do. Um, and from a kind of strategic side, it was still legacy running on premise um, and not capable of having a compliant software as a service version. Uh, but we're basically looking at these two pieces, one was the data set for the student information system and one is the CRM to actually surface that information uh, and allow us to be more smart and actually be able to target students as much as you just expect them to turn up on the door but also to have a level of customer insight um being able to allow us to interact at, at, at a point ahead of them ahead of a problem occurring that we can interact uh, to avoid any 
any complications to whilst they were here. Um, but a whole different raft of different manners um, effectively is strategic enabler um, that would align us back to our corporate vision. Um, so yeah, we had CRM, looked at CRM. Uh, we are say just about the process of handing that over to operations um, and our student information system um, is a just about to, or is a journey we're just about to embark on. Um, one thing that's come quite apparent and hence why we engage with Qantas is that again, we focus largely on the technology, don't want to do a lot of analysis, um, but actually we needed to understand the absolute need for the data strategy um, as we're both complex, the systems are very complex and uh, understanding the enablement that they were going to drive we needed to ensure that the data quality, um, both of that was pre-existing information that was in our student information system was um, effectively uh, cleansed, migrated, matured enough before we started looking to populate that into a new student information system, but also understanding that the uh, CRM, which effectively was the uh, technology that surfaced that data, um, wasn't just going to be populated and filled with a load of legacy information or incorrect data. Um, that would basically undo all of the good stuff that was there to do in the forefront. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and what about, you, you have, you've, you've touched on the university's wider strategic aims, Alex. What, is data strategy supporting those? And if so, you know, how, how are they linking together? Yeah, I think uh, there's a couple of bits really. So going back to the point I said right at the beginning of the session is we, um, we've got lots of data. It's, we've got so much data. The problem is it's just widespread over lots and lots of different um, technologies. And the point I think a really good bit I actually missed when I was um, thinking about the session today was about how over the, even over the last 12 months, how we've moved all of our data onto online technologies such as Microsoft Teams and the yeah. sheer amount of stuff that, that's going in there and actually it's almost becoming an untidy filing cabinet um, and trying to find that information and, 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 and where it resides um, it's, it's, it's certainly something that's coming to, to my mind right now mm. um, but if that has been problematic um, for some years um, it's basically led to us to making some potential so um, wrong decisions um, and also probably going back to the where we potentially be prior, prioritised incorrectly in terms of some of the um, investments that we've done um, over the last few years. Um, I think strategically, um, we would, I suppose in an ideal world, we'd have the single, um, single version of the truth, um, a single pane glass view of our student, which mm -hmm. would ultimately allow us to um, give a better experience for them whilst they were here. Um, and the university really um, needed to demand more from its data um, to, you know, to, to allow it to use it as that, that richness um, to, to help steer not only local roadmaps and, and, and strategies, but almost potentially influencing right up to the top level corporate strategy as well. Um, it, would, it would probably, other things to think about is when looking at the data side of things is, is although it's giving a, a student insight, we don't want it to be, uh, it's gonna be unintrusive um, yeah. So we're not going into a level of, of detail that, um, that, that, that's inappropriate. Um, but it's at the point that we've got enough information to say to engage um, and interact with the students at the appropriate time. Now, again, that's my background, it was hospitality. And my, my slogan always used to be, it was knowing what the customer wanted ahead of them asking for it. Um, and I think that's somewhat the same if you look at this Absolutely. university strategy. It's exactly that. It's kind of knowing what does a student want ahead of them asking for it to engage at the right time, avoid... Um, any issues whilst they're studying here, but also having a level of um, insight to be able to practically target students as well, um, not just expecting them to, to turn up on the door after receiving A-level results. Um, and then also the last year, it's probably given us that, um, I think you said yourself, Melody, was actually given the factual information to help quantify some of our decisions yeah. um, and, and really allowing us to kind of say, well, we think it's this, but actually having that, that information to actually say yes that's the right thing to do and actually that's that, that's where the problem resides yeah, yeah Alex, that's, that's a lovely example of how um, your experience from another sector has been really useful uh, in your, your transition over to, mm. to HE mm. and, and and look I think one of the reasons why you know the this series has been really popular is because I, I think uh, you know our, our feedback's been that people genuinely really uh, appreciate the uh, openness and honesty that our, our panelists have, have, have you know put put forward in, in just telling us like what's more 
you know how, how it's been so I think, and, and with that in mind I wonder if, if you if you would if you are able to sort of share with us any thoughts about you know now, now that you've got the benefit of hindsight is there anything you would that you would have done differently or any kind of tip top tips you can give our, our <laughs> yeah. viewers here <laughs> yeah no absolutely so so yeah if we go back to the transformation program and and that we we started off with the serum um in the first instance and had of let's I'll focus on CRM and SRS because that was the two main components of our um, transformation program. It was a, ri- a, a kind of mixed view as to which one should come first and where the value lied. Um, and everybody said some, some, somewhat something different. But effectively, we made the decision to embark as a CRM in the first instance purely because we could use it much as you would um, in a sales role and account management piece. You could proactively target students. Um, whether it's via social media or it's via kind of inquiry management um, and, and actually using it as an engagement piece to go out there and, and go, hey, look, we're LSBU, come and, come and join us and, and being able to nurture them into uh, potentially becoming a student here. So we did that first um, and then we, as I said, we come with to the student information system secondary. Now, if we were to do it differently, what we have learned, although don't get me wrong, yes, we have unlocked a great deal of um, potential and, and benefit by doing CRM um, is actually you're realizing now that the data, the intelligence and whether it populates the CRM, although there are different um, means of doing so, but actually the real um, information resides within the student information system. And at the moment, we probably, if I did it differently, I would have, we, I think I would have go, if I could turn out the clock, I can't, but it's fine. We can still, <laughs> still doing positives now. Um, it's probably would have looked at the data set in the first instance and doing student um, information system and then the CRM. Um, but if I look on a broader perspective, there are only two topics, as I say, related to our student transformation program. Um, we also important to highlight other topics, hot topics at the moment, things like identity and access management. Um, what is an identity of a person, um, anyone who um, effectively has access to the LSP environment. Um, and integration, as you say, you've got a vast technology landscape. Um, the data is all out there sporadically spread and actually been able to automate and, and get, you know, get grab that data into a central repository to allow you to effectively use that to, to feed off other systems as well. Yeah. Um, I'm waffling a little bit, but I think if you were to ask me to take the honest of you, and it sounds a bit cheesy because of the session we're on, but I absolutely would stress if anyone is at the position where they're deciding what to do is to probably just go with the data strategy in the first instance, which will help you define what should come, you know, where's that value lie, and what is the enable, what's the sequencing, the enablement to be able to deliver some of the yeah. um, top level objectives that you have. So um, it would be data, identity, integration, System information system, then CRM, if it were me. And then, of course, at the tail end, you'd be able to do all that the, the, the UX layer, the, you know, the app applications, low code, no code, web apps, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, you know, it's it, you know, a great thing about higher education. That's that's just my view. And I'm a technology <laughs> guy. Um, you might ask somebody else, might be a different answer. But, um, but that it, that's really having gone through the motion. Don't get me wrong, we, we're not, we haven't completed it yet, but kind of somewhat way through. If we were to go back, I think that was really where I would have started. Yeah, that's really that's really interesting, isn't it? I think um, there is definitely a seat at the table for data strategy really early on when any institution is thinking about embarking on any sort of transition or transformation, and and it sits in in amongst that sort of wider program of change, right? But if you have that right at the beginning, then you can make decisions and you can help sequence out that program of work. And quite often it encompasses the technology and the integrations and all the other stuff as well as you sort of go through it so sure. yeah that's really helpful yeah there's two sides. i think it's just unlocking the value and actually saying well what's going to help us for our immediate goals both short medium and long term but there is a you know and of course there's always a technical um, consideration behind it as well <laughs> that but um the, the, at least this the strategy um allows it gets the buy-in from the business. It allows you to get a sense of agreement and a roadmap of delivery. Yeah. Really it also cool. allows you to, to, to gain capability um, elements that need to be considered as well, because we've got yeah. the data and you're doing, well, let's be clear, we're doing large transformation. We're doing that pace. Um, it's great if you, to go back to you deliver the best systems in the world with great data, but if you don't um, 
bring the people along with you as thanks well your, and, and, and it's, it's around um, your actually thanks for your view but you, know, you, said, you said it's you know your view because actually uh, we had a question in the q a from from andrea oh, it doesn't matter so i'm really glad that you kind of <laughs> naturally answered that as we went through i, I just want to i want to finish uh kind of co- the, the questions to you alex if i may by kind of focusing on the art of the possible right i mean you we, I, I introduced melody as an ed tech evangelist you, you you you've you've i think you've you've uh, cemented yourself as a data evangelist today alex in the way that you, you've been you've been speaking so let let me let me finish by asking you what opportunities have you now do you think alice b you have now got you know what's the future looking like for you is it intelligent automation prescriptive analytics are you you know sort of shooting for the stars now yeah, I think um that's gonna be wrong, absolutely. I think that you know this strategically um what I embarked when I came here was um to try and automate stage one and two of any process, you know, to to to, to do that via um I guess with repetition. A lot of the stuff that happens is just the same thing happening over and over again. Um in terms of us, it was understanding okay, you've got a basic understanding of kind of frequently asked questions, but also um, the whole trend analysis, analysis and learning um, in terms of uh, implementing machine learning um, to actually not just what people think, but actually let's leverage what the technology mm. is doing as well. Um, so initially, we're looking at the moment doing a large amount of kind of data analysis and trend analysis across the estate, um, which will give us enough to then start looking into the predictive side. Um, once we start doing that, we can then start surfacing a lot of um, automation by the means of, yes, chatbots, which have been around for some time, um, but also, uh, I guess, in terms of design principles for some of the technologies that we're doing as well. Um, we're also looking to, as I say, to looking at right now our data warehouse um, in the first instance and just reassessing and understanding what reporting we're doing. Um, Going back to your point, is there lots of analysis, but understanding actually is it the right level of data and, and what reports are we doing and who's the audience of them? Um, and actually, are we wasting lots of time on unnecessary areas where we could actually um, be striving to, to deliver the, you know, the, uh, the, the, t- the top stuff that really has that value? Um, but understanding how we, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole raft, it's a journey. Um, there are means quick wins, such as things like RPA, um, which I know mm. Qantas is, is a big, fan, big fans of as well. Um, that allowed us to do a sense of value up front whilst working on some of the kind of uh, bigger, more kind of strategic moves as well. Amazing. Thank you, Alex. Uh, uh, As I say, we really appreciate your honesty. And I I think, Melody, we want to just come on to sort of finish with some sort of practical takeaways. And then um, I know we're rapidly coming to the end of our session. Thanks so much for those of you that are still uh, staying with us to to the end. But we've, we've, we've got an exciting questions for you. So... So yeah, I'll, I'll let Melody sort of carry on uh, with our tools. And okay, thank you. Thank you so. very much. And thank you, Alex, so much for your for your time. I appreciate that you might have at 11 o'clock. So if you need to to discreetly make an exit, then by all means, um, um, uh, wave goodbye and uh, uh, we can catch up later. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been an absolute pleasure today. Uh, and I look forward to uh, what to say to catching up with you guys a little bit later on. Thank you. Thank, thank you very yes, much. Thanks. Lovely day. Bye. Take care. So, so I wanted to really quickly, before we draw the, the webinar to a close, just give you a, a brief um, overview of what it might take to build an effective data strategy. Now, this is, this is a, a very high level overview of the methodology. One of the methodologies, actually, we have a number of methodologies, but they essentially all work to the same, to the same um, uh, phases. So the first thing really is to understand what your as is, is, right? So we might do a data maturity assessment and I'll come onto that very shortly and give you a, a quick snapshot of what that actually looks like. We might take a look at all your data policies, you know, make sure that they're all, you know, assess where they are. Are they, are they up to date? Are they maintained? Are they current? Uh, do they adhere to all the GDPR data protection things that we need them to? Does your data governance framework, is it fit for purpose? And we might then look at your university strategic objectives and understand where where we think data can help you um, achieve those goals. And then we help you define what your data vision and your data principles are as well. So what do you want to get from your data? What is your overriding governing principle for your data in your institution? And then we spend some time 
uh, with you guys to understand some data capabilities. So we might pick some user cases just to help define what some of the challenges are. So let's, let's pick your priorities. Let's work through what they look like. Let's work through some of the challenges in each of the dimensions, get you to a position where we can then roadmap some solutions out for those particular priorities. And we might then do some design work around that as well. And the culmination of that is really is to provide you with a data strategy and then a roadmap and a development plan and some program planning that allows you to understand where you are, understand where you want to be, and then understand how you get there and how long it's going to take and what, you know, some sort of budget constraints and a time and resourcing around those particular things. So that's really it's a really quick whistle stop tour of how <laughs> of how we might um, help you define what a data strategy might look like. And I wanted to show you then um, what a data maturity framework um, might look like once we've done it. So we do this we do this activity, and then what happens is we ask you to assess yourselves, and we give you a. Um, we give you a, an assessment really of where you are. So we might say actually you're in the emerging stage or you're unaware, but actually where you want to be and what we've discovered is you want to be at the developing or mastery level of each of these dimensions. And then we help you get there with, you know, with a series of recommendations and activities to drive that forward. So I appreciate it. we've gone over time and I can imagine, I can imagine people have got things to get to. So just some strategically hugely important element of any institution's digital transformation or digital tra transition journey. And we really strongly encourage you to um, interact with that very early on in your thinking to help you define what the rest of your programmes of change might look like. Um, so I, I don't know how many people are still here, but I, um, yeah, I think we might we, we we might have okay, to send it. Perfect, up. perfect, perfect. Um, and if there are any questions, I, I appreciate we're we're sort of out of time, so we'll also round up any questions. And if you have anything to send to us afterwards, by yeah. all means, do so, um, and and we can we can make sure we respond to those questions as well. Uh, and if there's anything happening at your institute that you think would be interesting, we've got an interesting project that you'd like to share with us, get in touch. We'd love, we love having people on these webinars. We love talking about people's transformations and transitions and programs and thoughts and aspirations in the HE sector. So, you know, absolutely uh, drop us a line and, um, and we, can, we can talk. Uh, I think all that remains is for Jean and, uh, and I to say thank you very much for attending. It's been hopefully great for you i know i've had fun um so um and we'll see you next time thanks a lot everyone thank you see you bye bye